Where'd you get these two guys from? <laughs> So three of the Tack and Sport podcast with myself, Daniel Hussey, joined once again by my brother, Sean. How's it going? Firstly, you want to say thanks again for the feedback and support for episode two. That was highs and lows of special rugby with Charity Rock. Uh, for those that didn't listen, Charity Captain Black Rock to Senior Cup success in 2013 before moving to the Leinster Academy. Really good chat to Charity. We enjoyed listening to his story and we're glad to bring that to you and glad you enjoyed it as well. For episode one, Life as a Football Agent, we had Patrick Dean. Pat is a football agent with Quorum Sports and an update there. One of his players we spoke about, Daryl Shea. Uh, who's currently playing right back for West Brom, actually scored a crucial second goal for them in a 2-0 win last Wednesday as they creep ever closer to the Premier League. So, Sean, I think West Brom Twitter have hailed him the Irish Cafu, so high praise indeed. I think there's a few Irish Cafus at the moment. Obviously, you've got Seamus Coleman, Matt Doherty playing in the Premier League. It's probably an area where we're at our strongest. Cyrus Christie also, a bit of a renaissance of him under Scott Parker at Fulham. So, great to see Dara score. He's a centre-half by trade, but you know it's like that in championship clubs wherever you get your break as a young person, you've got to try and, and take it. And the likes of him, Jason Malumbi, Jason Knight, all in the championship this year have taken their chances and you know especially with Stephen Kenny they'll be looking to push into that senior squad in, in the next year or so exactly and like you said it's someone who's definitely in contention for an Ireland call, a call up particularly as Dara plays centre back for the under 21s throughout Stephen Kenny's reign so yeah both of those shows are in all your podcast feeds now and well worth the listen a couple of exciting now- announcements before we get going we decided to go for two shows a week so we're continuing with our interview format every Monday but we're also planning a new topic show release every Wednesday uh, and that's starting this Wednesday. So we'll have guests to discuss certain topics. We want to cover sports like tennis, golf, cricket, horse racing, American sports. Nothing really is off the table. Uh, for example, this Wednesday would be an exciting show where we're going to speak about Bryson DeChambeau and his transformation in golf. Um, for those that aren't aware, he's used lockdown to put on a, essentially, well, in the last few months anyway, he's put on two to three stone. Uh, and we're joined by former winner of the European Tour, Peter Lowry, and Maliki Clerken of the Irish Times. So we're going to discuss that transformation. Is it good for golf? Maliki's article about Bryson last week in the Times, if you want to check that out before. Uh, Brooks' tweet insinuating certain things about Bryson. And also we're going to preview the return of Tiger Woods on Thursday at the Memorial. So it's exciting times for golf with the likes of a World Golf Championship coming up the week next week. And the uh, USPJ the following week so we're excited to bring that to you if you do have any ideas for a topic um, do get in touch with the show at, at Tack and Sport on all social media uh, one of the ideas we're going to be doing next Wednesday is a referee show where we're joined by an inter-county referee on recent rule changes and that came from a suggestion from Connor Keane so thanks for getting in touch Connor and we, if anyone does want to get their topic mentioned uh, again at Tack and Sport on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and Sean I think there are rumours that I'm going to be starting a TikTok soon yeah well I, I, I don't want any part of it personally I have, a few, I have a few funny videos. So, yeah, that, that'll be starting. I don't care how many followers we have. Or you can get us the old-fashioned way. Email us at editor at tactonsport.com. Anyway, that's exciting plans we've got coming a week. It's going to be Monday and Wednesday going forward. Sean, what do we got lined up for this week? Yeah, we speak to Kevin Day, a comedian. Works on a lot of sports shows. He'll tell us how he got into comedy, um, how he got onto working on sports shows, some of the characters he's, he's dealt with and he deals with, his own podcast, The Price of Football, and, of course, what it's like supporting Crystal Palace. So very interesting podcasts and some funny stories. Really enjoyed our chat with Kevin. Speaks very passionately about money and football. We'll have a good chat, Sean, afterwards about the interview. So stay tuned to the end to hear how he convinced Jamie Redknapp you couldn't banter during Ramadan and his grey-haired sporting hero that brought him to tears when he met him. There'll be music from Benjamin to come, but let's get to the interview. So delighted to welcome to the podcast, stand-up comedian, former Match of the Day presenter, writer for shows like A League of Their Own, 8 Out of 10 Caps, Have I Got News For You, presenter of the Price of Football podcast, but most importantly, a die-hard Crystal Palace fan. Kevin Day, welcome to the podcast, how are you? Uh, I'm alright actually, I've, I've just got over the disappointment of uh, last night against Chelsea. Uh, uh, Saturday I was I was about to give football up after a shocking display against Leicester, but I, I thought we played really well last night against a really good Chelsea side. So uh, I'm happier today than I was yesterday. Let's put it that way. And would would prem, would uh, is there a feeling amongst Palace fans that they're happy with how it is? Like would everyone agree with you, or are some people kind of pushing for a different direction? I I, th- I think it's a generational thing to be honest. I think those of us who who remember being in the third division, and sadly I'm old enough to do that. I remember going as a kid to you know, going away to Shrewsbury and, and places like that. For those of us who remember the bad days, for those of us who remember the two administrations and you know, it's only it's only ten years ago that we were five minutes from going out of business. We were setting up a Phoenix club. So 
those of us who remember those days are, are more than happy with just being in the Premier League. I mean, I think younger fans who, who don't remember those things want want more of the glory. They want the European trips. They want the. But sometimes, as you as you see, if you if you if you get above yourself, if you like, if like like Charlton, who are a really well run Premier League team, you know, I think finished like tenth five years running, and then suddenly the fans demanded more, and the club invested money they didn't have to try and get into Europe, and now they're struggling to 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 stay afloat, let alone get back in the Premier League so we're, we're a, well, a well run club the, the financial problems please God are a, a, a thing of the past so yeah I'm happy I mean the, the, there's no doubt that some of the football is disappointing I mean Roy Hodgson is a, is a great coach but there are times when yeah, it, it's lovely when Gary Neville says yeah Palace are well organised but when you're a season ticket holder just every now and again you'd like to see a bit more than well organised you know? and, and that's the one thing that was different about last night is actually we actually try to to win the game, and when 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 you do that, you don't mind losing to a better team. If you try and play football and try and win the game, it's when you lose at home to Burnley or lose away to Leicester, without without even giving it a go, and and by playing football from the from the dinosaur age, and we're capable of doing it, playing good football. But Roy just you know he seems to want to protect the point that we start with rather than always trying to win the game, but. Having said that, he keeps us. He keeps us in there. Yeah, you know, we're comfortably mid-table. So, it's just every now and again, I wish he'd let them off the leash a little bit. You know, and I, I wish he would give the younger players a, a bit of a go as well. It's like there's no, we're not going down. Fans, fans are perfectly happy to see kids. We've got a couple of kids. This one kid called Brandon Pirrick, who's who's possibly the new Wilf Sahar. But yeah, we'll never we'll never know if 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 Roy won't won't. Pick him, and it, it's the same with um, Aaron Wan-Bissaka. I mean, Roy didn't know about Aaron Wan-Bissaka, but we had such an injury crisis in the week facing going into a Tottenham game a couple of seasons ago. The academy coach said we got this kid called Wan-Bissaka, so he gets in the team, and then we sell him to Man United for forty-five million quid. We can't sell our kids if they're not getting on the pitch for other clubs to see them. You spoke of Roy Hodgson there and the generational thing. Um, I was wondering, do you want a young, exciting manager? Because I saw the Bristol City manager, the former Bristol City manager, Lee Johnson, getting sacked and a lot of Palace fans on Twitter cramming for him to be appointed next season. Um, what would be your take on that? Well, t- t- I think that's a really interesting question because I, I, I was really excited when we got Frank De Boer in. I thought that was a really ambitious appointment, one of the best coaches in European football. But it's quite clear that neither side had done their proper research. I mean, the guy who runs Palace TV told me that when Frank De Boer turned up at the training ground, he thought it was a practical joke. Like the guy at Brentford is a really good manager, but I don't really want Palace to be an experiment for a young, untried manager. But at the same time, you know, there's people talking, the Palace fans talking this week, and I'm doing a Palace podcast in a minute, and, and we've had loads of questions. It's like, get Sean Dyche in. It's like, well, what? Sean Dyche is Roy Hodgson, essentially. It's a, there's there's no point exchanging like for like, but at the other, yeah, you know, when we did try the Roy, the De Boer experiment, it was a, it was a disaster. So it's um, it it it's an interesting one. I, I I'm happy with Hodgson as manager. Most people are. He's a really decent bloke. It's just that, and it's nothing to do with his age. It's just that it, yeah, there's a recruitment issue at the club as well. That that's one of the problems is that Roy's not really in charge of recruitment. So he's not getting players he wants and I suppose as well with Roy you can't you, you can't ignore the fact that he's 73 so he's he's 54 years younger than some of the kids in the academy uh, older rather than some of the kids in the academy so he's he probably not he probably can't relate to some of them on a personal basis that's another issue but no I'm I, I'm happy with him and I hope that when he does leave it's because he wants to leave and not because we we get rid of him I'd be amazed if he's not our manager next season and again if he keeps us mid-table again I'd be perfectly happy with that. We could chat about Palace all day, but uh, Kevin, just moving on to your background for those that might not be aware, um, could you tell us a little bit of how you got into stand-up comedy and then onto comedy writing? I, I started in stand-up comedy almost by mistake, basically. There's, there's no there's no background of, of theatre in, in my family. My dad's English, my mum's from Donegal, uh, so my dad's family weren't funny and my mum's family all were, but there's no history of performing. There's no... It, but, um, we used to go when I was younger. You know, like we would go go and see comedy clubs. There are comedy clubs everywhere at, at that time, and we used to go to a couple of local comedy clubs. And I, to be honest, I just thought it was middle class nonsense. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I used to enjoy it, but I used to moan to my mates all the time. I used to say, "Why are we paying money to watch these people prat about?" You know. And eventually, they, my mates got so fed up with this that they decided to an open spot just to sort of shut me up, basically. Um, so they booked me this open spot and I did it 
out of bravado and I, I wasn't I wasn't actually particularly nervous because I had no intention of becoming a stand-up comedian. I just thought this would be the one and only time I was ever on stage. Uh, not that it was a stage, it was actually a, it was just a crate behind the microphone. So I, I, I got this sort of five minutes of material together and it, was, and it was fine. And the guy who ran the club said, do you want to come back and do uh, 10 minutes? And I said, well, not really. And he, he persuaded me. And so I did, I went back and did 10 minutes and that was a bit more nerve wracking. And then suddenly over a year, I just, I just fell in love with it and I had a really good job at the time. I was working for the NHS. I had a good career path ahead of me, but I just, it just got into my bones. I just felt, I just fell in love with, and it, I discovered an ego that I never knew I had. And, and, you know, cause any, any stand up comedian who tells you they haven't got an ego is, is lying. We've all got massive egos because you have to have an ego because for the first two years, every stand up comic is rubbish. All of us are absolute rubbish. Billy Connolly was rubbish before he started. Eddie Izzard was rubbish before he started. McIntyre was rubbish. I can just testify that. But you, yet you still get up on stage in front of complete strangers, convinced that you're you're able to make them laugh. But it just it became the thing I wanted to do. So I I took a deep breath and left my uh, NHS career, which broke my mum's heart. As a, I was the first one in my family to go to university, and I got thrown out after three months. So. That broke her heart as well. So she wasn't best pleased when I left the the good career in the NHS that I had as well. But and she she hated she. My dad used to love it. He'd come to gigs, but my mum, I think she saw me once, but she hated it so much. She got so nervous on my behalf, which is not really a compliment when you think about it. But she um she never really liked it till the day she died. What I did for a living, but I still, with all the things that I do, I still when people say to me what do you do, I still say oh, I'm a stand up comedian. That's what I do, even though I do relatively few live gigs these days and the problem for my wife is who works in the theatre as well is that my son Ed who's Ed Knight is also a really good stand-up comedian so my poor wife has got two testosterone fueled idiots in the family now and if we've if we've both got a gig on the same night we're both kicking the door open after doing well we're both telling her how well we've done and we have to argue about who's going to tell her first how funny we were that night so but it's still it's still my passion it's still it's still what I love doing and because I don't do actual stand-up comedy for a living anymore uh, the gigs I do I can pick and choose what live gigs to do I really I enjoy them that much more because I get to pick and choose rather than having to schlep around the country every night just to make a living so in that sense Kevin would you say stand-up comedy to you would might be more of a hobby or yeah I, I, would, I would never call it a hobby because that would sort of because I, I take it very seriously. Like you say, I can pick and choose, and it, and it means that a lot of the gigs I do are benefits now at theatre, so I can I, I can really look forward to them rather than... Because there, there were times, I have to admit, when every now and again you'd go, oh, Jesus, I've got to go to Bradford tonight, and it's like, not I've got anything against Bradford in particular, that was just a, a random example, but um, there were there were times when, you know, if you were doing 14 nights in a row, you'd get a, you'd get a bit... You wouldn't know where you were, and it's like... I used to compare the comedy store and you do five shows a weekend and by show five you didn't know whether you'd said something five minutes ago or two days ago so but no I still I still love it but it's just that I'm fortunate enough to have other ways to to make the bulk of my living now so obviously Kevin being a big sports fan uh, and being a stand-up uh, comedian was moving on to a Channel 5 sports show uh, a natural step for you it, it, it wasn't really I, I had to be it, it's strange I kind of got into comedy by accident but I also had to be talked into writing um, the guy who produced um, uh, they think it's all over which is before your time it's a sports show presented by Nick Hancock that had Gary Lineker as team captain and Jonathan Ross and it was it was very much of its time it was very much early 90s somebody reminded me the other day of some of the jokes we did about princess diana and it's like how we got away with that i don't i don't know and it's like we did one joke about fatima whitbread for example which you simply wouldn't be allowed to do now and to her to her credit she she wrote to complain about this joke and that if we bunged ten thousand quid to a charity she'd forget all about it which was great but we had this running joke about that, that richard keys the sky sports presenter was the hairiest man in the world and it's like it was quite a brutal show and harry thompson god rest his soul who was the producer on a weekly basis, got in touch with me to say, we want you to come and come and write on this because you're a very funny comedian and we and you know your sport. And I just kept saying, look, I've got too much integrity. I'm a stand-up comedian. I'm a, I'm, I'm pure. I, you know, I go around the country telling, tell, not even telling jokes, but doing routines and bringing down the government. And that's the sort of and And after about a year, he told me how much the writers got on a daily basis. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me that in the first place? I would have done it a year ago, basically. 
because it's quite it's quite well paid. So I, I I got into that, and then at the same time I was asked to be, uh, to present Live and Dangerous on Channel Five, which was um, it was on twice a week. Uh, it was live. I don't know why it was particularly dangerous, uh, but it was on about midnight, one o'clock in the morning. Uh, I, I still occasionally get recognised by security guards because they were the only people that watched it. So, uh, and then it just sort of. It, it just sort of came from there and it just sort of other people noticed that I, I was writing on this show and then yeah so uh, have I got news for you the company that made that approached me and it, it, it just kind of went from there reason but um because I've always been I, I love talking about sport especially football and horse racing but at, at the start I was sort of quite um I wasn't snobby about it because my comedy was very political but I, I was worried about getting pigeonholed as like the the sports stand-up or the sports writer so I always made sure there was a lot of other stuff going on but now I'm 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 perfectly happy for people to know me as uh, by sport I don't care if people don't know what my politics are I, I love it when people say to me oh yeah you're the Palace fan Palace gives me my identity I was I, I was born and still live in a part of South London that you can't really point to it on a map it's where sort of three bland suburbs sort of melt, melt into each other there's no landmarks so unless you're from there you wouldn't really know whereabouts in London it was so being a Palace fan has given me a lot of my London identity if you like and I'm really pleased that that when when people say oh yeah you're the Palace fan or you you talk about Palace all the time I'm, I love that and I'm also I'm really pleased when when people understand that I'm a real advocate for for football that I will defend football and I will defend football fans uh to the end of my life because I think football fans are still unfairly maligned by a lot of the press and a lot of the middle class media and football fans are a wide range of people we when the the two times Palace went into administration and we were setting up organizations to 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 raise money and to to raise awareness you know there was there was accountants there was lawyers yeah there were plumbers and there were taxi drivers but there's a, 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 people from all walks of life support uh football and I, you know, I'm I'm probably the happiest I have, I'm, I am in life, is and I can't wait to get back there. It's, it's not so much the game itself; it's it's the two hours in the pub. I love that pub we go to before games, and as my wife described it, talking the same bollocks to the same people in the same table in the same corner in the same pub for twenty years. But that's what football is for me, you know. And it's and I, I love the fact when people recognise that I will support football. And that's that's why I'm so pleased that the the price of football podcast is is going so well because that's a practical way we can we can help football fans and try and hold clubs to account so i really i can't even remember what the question was now i just realized i've been talking for five minutes but um i hope that's answered it well kevin just obviously growing up you would have watched as a football fan you would have watched a lot of match of the day tell us about um being asked to work on match of the day what was that like i i think it's it's still I haven't. I stopped. Finished. Well, I, officially, I haven't stopped doing it. It's just that once they moved to the BBC Sport, moved to Manchester, it kind of fell away. And I think I've probably had done enough coach journeys around the country anyway. But it, that's one of the things I'm really proud of as well, because um, it, it. I think it's one of the first things on telly where the fans got their got their say and they got to see other fans. And it it it. It came about because the the guy who produced Match of the Day Two when it first started was a Palace fan, basically, um, and he thought it needed a, a, a sort of fan involvement, if you like. And initially, the idea was that I would actually be in the studio and just like for the last two minutes of the show, where they where they do where they still do too too good too bad. The idea was I would do like two or three minutes chat at the end about the football that weekend funny chat hopefully um but what happened was that the first three shows overran so much that i only got a chance to say hello so they said well this is not working so let's get you out out and about and it's um i was a bit cross at first because i wanted to be in the studio i wanted to be with the cool the cool guys like gordon strachan uh who's still the person who's taught me most about football than, than anybody else but just doing those fan pieces were great and it, it kind of helped that i was a palace fan as well because people sort of knew I wasn't a threat, if you like, because we were in a, in the championship at the time. People thought it was quite cool that I supported my local team, and that it, it, I think it would have been harder to do it if I'd been an Arsenal fan or a, or a Man United fan. But I, I think it's the job I've enjoyed the most. I just had a great time. Basically, I got paid to go up and down the country and and watch football matches, and and before that to chat to a few people and have a laugh with 
with football fans. So I was I was very proud to be part of that. And also, the the first time I, I heard the Match of the Day theme tune, and I was on the show, was like for a kid of my generation that was that was kind of overwhelming a little bit. And then the, the season after that, I was actually on the the main Match of the Day. And, and for, as I say, for my yeah, I grew up watching. You know, as a kid, you'd wait for Match of the Day to come on, uh, and it, to be part of that institution was was just mind-boggling for a time. And I I, I love doing it, and I, I I wish I was still doing it as well. But it's it's although st- strangely enough, like like a lot of people, it was the regional. It was the Sunday afternoon London football program that got me most excited. Uh, and if I'd ever got a chance to do that, I would have been brilliant. But just, to, I just remember the first time uh, I was on a pitch before a game doing match of the day two, and he just said, I'd been on the pitch a couple of times at Palace to do charity stuff. I, I'm, I'm, I missed a penalty in a charity thing at Palace at half time, uh, which was harsh because you know ten thousand Palace fans making comments about your weight, even though you, they know you love the club. Uh, as I missed the penalty, wasn't wasn't nice, but. I remember being on the pitch at, I think it was West Brom before a game. I'm just thinking, oh, this is every single football fan in this ground would love to be on the pitch where I am now interviewing somebody. And it's like, I remember interviewing Tony Pulis at Stoke just before a game. And it's just like, I remember being allowed in a tunnel uh, in a in a dressing room at, at Watford. And it's just think, this is just amazing, amazing access. So, and what what I loved most about it is is you you realise that football, even at the Premier League level, when you get to a dressing room, football is just like a Sunday league team. So like I've only ever played Sunday league football, and I was terrible. I was the world's slowest right back. Even as a twenty-one-year-old, I was really dreadfully, laughably slow. But when you're in a dre- you get in a dressing room, it's the same smell of liniment. It's the same. It's just young blokes who, taking the piss out of each other, who just want to play football. When you when you boil football down, even at the highest level, when you boil it down to its basics, it's just a group of lads or a group of girls who want to go out and, and play football. And the difference is that they're doing it in front of 35,000 people at, at, at Molyneux or whatever, rather than doing it in their local park on a Sunday. So it was a, it was a brilliant to get... Some of the access we got was 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 fantastic. And clubs were a bit reluctant at, at first because they thought that I was there to take the piss. But when they realised that I was there to sort of show the good side of clubs, and so, clubs, just all of them, even was so friendly even man united which i didn't expect like bent over backwards to to help out um so it was it was, it was lovely it was a great experience i really enjoyed it probably the one of the biggest difference from sunday league to professional football is obviously the money side of it and um, and as we said earlier you co-host and um, the price of football podcast which is a great yeah. podcast tell us a bit about that and tell us why you it's so important to you uh, well, it's nice of you to uh, dignify me with the title of co-host because uh, it, essentially I asked the questions and Kieran Maguire, who's a lecturer in football finance at Liverpool University, the, um, the only one in the country, he he answers them. Um, essentially, uh, around about October last year, a guy from the BBC got in touch with me. He said, Look, I've had this idea about doing a podcast about football finances. And I went, well, that sounds fascinating. Good luck with that. Um and then he got back to me and said, "No, look, I'd really like you to to host it." And I said, "Well, the the problem is, I, I'm I'm not sure anybody would be interested. And also, I know nothing about finances. My wife, was, it drives everybody in my house up the wall. I'm terrible with money. I'm useless with finances. I'm not interested in in finances." And he said, "Well, that's exactly why I want you to do it because we want you to be the the idiot asking the idiot questions." And I'm well, thank you very much. I think I can do that. So. Um, I met Kieran for the first time. We had no relationship beforehand. We got on really well, even though he's a teetotal Brighton fan, which is the opposite. As I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners will know that Palace and Brighton is a, is a strange rivalry, but it's a it's a proper bitter rivalry. We we really don't like Brighton fans, and they don't like us. So we we put that to one side, uh, and the fact that he was teetotal, we put that to one side, and we got on really well. But both of us thought that we would do this podcast for four weeks, and that. After four weeks, we'd realised that only 20 people would listen to all four episodes. But it, it turned out that, that people had a, a, an appetite. They wanted to learn about what was going on in football finances. And it was a, it was an awful thing for Berry, but it was a stroke of, a stroke of luck for us that the, the, the demise of Berry uh, happened the week we did our first episode. Kieran really, really went into the figures in some detail and 
and really laid into Steve Dale, the Berry owner. And and that sort of got some resonance and football fans realised that. And then it, it, it just took off from there. We've we've got about forty thousand listeners a week. Um I've got no doubt you'll take over us you'll take us over in a in a few weeks' time, lads, but we got forty thousand listeners a week and people uh, uh, the the only problem with it is there's no there's no good news. The 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 day we get to say actually football clubs are all behaving really sensibly, they've all got enough money to survive, is the day we stop doing the podcast. But because it, it, it's, it's all bad news to an extent, but it, it's just become really important to highlight the money that's being spent. If the championship, as, as you'll know if you've listened, the championship is a basket case. I mean, there's not a club in the championship that's that isn't making a, a loss, and there's, there are clubs in the championship that the, the UEFA recommendations are that for every uh, £100 you get in, you shouldn't spend more than... Uh, 80 pound on wages and there are, there are, there's not one club in the championship that isn't spending more than 100 pound on wages for every 100 they get and there's a couple of clubs that are spending 300 pound is they basically their wage bill is is 1.5 times higher than their income because they're all gambling everything to get into the premier league because even one season in the premier league um can can see them through for five six years so what what we're trying to do on the pod apart from take the piss out of each other we're trying to highlight the the discrepancy in football finance because I knew money wasn't fairly distributed in in football. I think we all knew that. We all instinctively knew that football finances weren't fair. But to have that confirmed on a on a twice weekly basis is still is still really upsetting for me. When you when you see clubs like Oswestry Town, you know they're in the seventh tier of football. But for the for the five hundred fans of Oswestry Town that go every week, they're the most important football team, in the, and they went bust this week. For for the want of fifteen thousand quid, and there's like there's ten football clubs, ten championship and Premier League clubs within thirty miles. Somebody could have found fifteen thousand quid to bail out that club, and it's it's disgraceful that that that's not happening. And and yeah, you, there are good news stories. You find out that you know the the Premier League as an organisation actually does because it's a strange thing. The Premier League, I thought there was like a Premier League, but the Premier League consists of the twenty clubs that are in the Premier League at any one time, essentially. Um, but they do they do an awful lot of money an awful lot of money goes from the premier league to to charities and to foundations and to football and that's great but it's it's every day you hear something the latest one is the wigan story which we're determined to get to the bottom of we we're, we're talking to the mayor of manchester on the show we're recording tonight for tomorrow's show we're, uh in fact, I've got three podcasts today. You're the first of three pods, so I feel quite important today. But we're talking to the Mayor of Manchester about the Wigan situation. And without getting into too much detail on here, because I, I don't want to get sued and I don't want you to get sued, That's an absolute, it's an absolute disgrace. Basically, Wigan's been stitched up by three professional gamblers, essentially, who seem to have passed the club around them and used it as a, as a, as a leverage to pay bets. And I... And it's you know the FA have got to step in and sort that out, and 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 the government has to step in and sort that out basically because you know through no fault of of their own really, Wigan are now in administration with a twelve point deduction, and of course as what as always happens when you get wrongins like the guy at Berry, when you get wrongins like the guy at Macclesfield, and wrongins like the people at Wigan, it's the fans that suffer. It's always the fans that suffer, and that's. That's really not right. The, the 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 EFL and the Premier League need to find a way of punishing club owners that doesn't involve punishing football fans. And also, they've got to get the fit and proper person tests are not are just ludicrous. They basically ask you, "Have you got enough money to buy this club? Are you in prison?" And if the if the answer to the first question is yes, and the answer to the second question is no, then you're allowed to buy a club. And basically, even if the answer to the second question is yes, I am in prison, they'll say, "Well, can you put the." The club under a different name it's just it, it's really terrible the EFL have, have really neglected their duty I think when it comes to clubs like Berry, and, and, and it's it's shameful and I, I I'm just hoping and, I, and I, I I think I'm optimistic about I think most football clubs will get through Covid I think there will be casualties outside the football league itself unfortunately but Wigan's got nothing to do with with Covid Wigan's got to do with three people who know nothing about football gambling the future of, of, of Wigan Athletic and it's a it's an outrage. Yeah, no, the way you kinda of say that about the EFL ownership, I suppose it's it's almost nearly funny, Kevin and Sean, I know you want to come in there. 
Yeah, well, the thing I'm most worried about is Boltonbury and Wigan are all from the similar northwest area near Lancashire. Yeah. And then you've got the two big clubs in Liverpool and Manchester United who are thriving. And my worry is it's a very working class area up there. A lot of people spend a lot of money, uh, work hard during the week to go and watch the football on a Saturday, Sunday. The English, F- the EFL and the Premier League to a certain degree are letting these these fans down. And uh, yeah. as you rightly said, Kevin, the, the worrying trend is that it's in the northwest of England and it's not in, it's not really spread out as much as, as maybe it should be. Well, that's a really good point because... In a way, I mean, but you know, in the fifties, for example, Bolton were a huge club. But when you've got teams up there, you know, like, like Morecambe and Macclesfield and Wigan and Bury and Bolton and Rochdale, uh, who are all operating in the shadow of, of Man City, Man United, it, it, it's kind of a miracle that they've survived for as long as they have, anyway, basically, because all the all the attention, all the fuss goes to the two big Manchester clubs. But but Man City could could solve the problems of, of every club. They could have, they could have sorted Berry out. I mean I mean Everton, Bill Kenwright, uh, the the chief shareholder at Everton at the time, who's a really nice guy, he offered to bail Berry out. And and the the football authorities, the Premier League and the English Football League said no, you can't do that because essentially you're having a stake in two clubs, and that's not allowed. And, that, and that's just ludicrous. They just they just should have just said that's that's fine. It's like Palace, Steve Parrish, to his credit, tries to keep an eye on local clubs because he knows that the pyramid is very important. It's like we might be the big dogs in South London at the moment, but it's really important to make sure that clubs at a lower league level around us survive. And, and you know, sometimes, it's like I say, it only, this could be 15, 20,000 quid that helps them survive. But I've, I think you're absolutely right about the the working class thing because I, I, I do think that the government... You know, horse racing was the first sport to come back. I do think the government are genuinely more interested in sports that they can relate to. And I do think that they think, that, that A, that they think football is awash with money so that it should be able to sort itself out. But B, you know, Boris Johnson and his cronies, they've got no idea what it's like to be a, a football fan living in the northwest of England. They don't. They may have gone to a football game once, possibly, as a guest of somebody in an executive box, but they, they don't know what it's like that to... to you know, to have the almost the only thing in your life that's good. Yeah, you know, there are towns all over our country that are struggling for austerity that ha- that have been since. I hate to sound like a, a, an eighties comedian, but that's what I am. You know, since the, the miners' strike and since Thatcher, that so many towns are, are just they've been destroyed. Their industries have been destroyed, and the football club is the only thing that they've got left to be proud of. But it's and it's a sense, that's why I don't. People say, well, football, why should football be treated differently to any other business? Because it should, because it's important to people, because people love their football club. And because, you know, even a, a club like Berry goes out of business, and it's not just Berry fans that are disappointed, you know, people say, oh, they can go and watch another football club. No, they, they can, but that's not the point. They're Berry fans. And also, Berry goes out of business. The company that prints the programme goes out of business. The cafes around the ground go out of business. It, all sorts of people take a hit when a football club goes under for the sake of a little money that the government or another club could provide. It, 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 as you can tell, it, it really it really annoys me. It does anger me. There's, there's so much football, uh, so much money in football, and th- th- there's, no, there's no excuse for allowing any club to go to the wall, none at all. Even if, even if you lend it to even if you allow Man City to lend... A club like Bury some money at, at no interest. Find a way, do something, sort it out. Clubs are too important to be allowed to go out of business. I suppose the Premier League silence on the Bury situation is is definitely deafening. And I know on the coronavirus that you've touched on, I suppose like the likes of League One and League Two not being able to come back because they're going to lose money and the Premier League making money. The gap between the lower leagues and the Premier League is realistically going to get bigger and bigger. Well, well, there is. I mean, there are. There are solidarity payments, which I again I didn't know about until doing the price of football. That the the Premier League do spread some money through football every year. It's not a lot, but there are you know League Two clubs will get something from the Premier League, but nowhere near enough to survive. But you're absolutely right about the virus, and it's it's I'm getting fed up with explaining to people the reasons why. But people say, well, why couldn't League One or League Two come back? And, And the simple reason is. You you put a game on behind closed doors. You still got to pay for stewards. You've got to pay for policing. You've got to test the players every four days, which costs a lot of money. Uh, you've got to take the players off furlough, which means you've got to pay them wages. And you're doing that with no fans coming through the gate. 
So it's costing you something like £50,000 a week to carry on playing and you're getting no pounds a week income through this. Whereas the Premier League and the EFL of, of course can afford to keep on playing. And I, I think I think the Premier League and the EFL would have come back earlier. So the Premier League, to their credit, resisted because it was the broadcasters where the, it was the broadcasters who really, really wanted to get football back on. It was Sky and BT who really wanted to get football back on because they pay a lot of money for the rights and they're sitting there thinking, well, hang on, we haven't got anything to show for it. And then, of course, the, the Premier League start to panic because Sky and BT are saying, well, look, you know, the, the deal next year, we, we can't pay you anywhere near as much as we're paying you this year because we're not, we haven't got any football to show. And then, of course, the, the, the club sponsors are going, well, hang on, you know, our, ad, our advert's not being shown on telly. So I think the, the Premier League did actually resist coming back too early. Um, but people assume, and that's what really annoys me, Daniel and Sean, people assume that the, the same level that all football is awash with money. People who don't know about football, people who don't understand football, uh, and I really feel sorry, I genuinely feel sorry for people who say, oh, I don't understand football. It's like, what do you talk about to strangers at weddings for a start off? It's like, you know, football has enriched all our lives, but people just assume that the whole of football has got money, that every club is, is rich and, and can survive this, and, and they can't, they simply can't. Yes, there are some clubs in money, but Tottenham had to take an emergency loan recently but that's the way it's the way of the world that because Tottenham are a very wealthy club it's very easy for them to lend money uh, or to or to borrow money at, at a small rate of interest whereas you know a club like Exeter it's impossible for them to borrow money because the banks don't think they can pay it back so it's it's genuinely unfair it, it needs a cleverer person than me to sort it out but there's got to be a way to make sure that fo- that money in football is is distributed more evenly and more fairly than it is now yeah and I remember listening to one of your episodes on Premier League um, and focusing on Liverpool and the potential of them losing money um, for winning the title. Uh, yeah, do you know what? Um, it, it, I, I try not to do. They, the, the producer tells me what the questions are going to be and what the subjects are going to be. And I, I try not to uh, research too much because I want to be like a listener. I want to be surprised as well. So when Kieran tells me the answer to things, I want that to come as news to me. Um and I, I still can't quite work out why why that is. Uh, but yes, it turns out Liverpool could lose money. I, do you know what? I, I, I tend to record the pod and then forget everything I've just said. It's like revising for an exam. Um, they, they, you know, Kieran's eyebrows would be going up and down now that I can't give you the answer to this question. But, but that's how the pod works, basically. I ask, I ask the questions, Kieran gives the answer, I forget the answer and we move on. But... Yes, it's it's to do with um, it's to do with shirt sponsorship and other things. And so they could, they could, I'm not giving you a very good answer to this. So I'll give you the standard broadcaster's answer. And say what well, what you have to do is go and listen to that pod. I'm just going to keep floundering right while I try and remember what's what's going on. Yeah, no, because I think it was to do with paying out uh, sponsorship and bonus and bonuses for winning the league. So like the ideal season was Spurs last season getting to the Champions League but not winning it and coming fourth in the Premier League but not winning it as well so oh yes that was it was to do with it was to do with bonuses uh, thank you thank, well reminded yeah yeah it was to do with bonuses and also uh, having to pay more for players in future thank you very much that's, that's I appreciate it. that's good broadcasting boys well done <laughs> no problem at all Kevin listen moving on to a league of their own um, tell us more about working on that show because it's 10 series now that um, you've done on the show uh, yes we're just starting back uh, we're going back in the studio luckily we're not doing it by Zoom we're going back into an actual studio which I can't wait obviously there'll be no audience but we're going back into the, the big studio because um, you've been to one of the show you've seen the recordings so you know how it works so um, I, I got involved with that just because I know the production company that, that, that ran it and that I know a couple of the guys that came up with the idea and they just approached me because I, I was a, a, a well-established and, and quite good comedy writer so they wanted me not only to write on it but also to be there on the studio day to look after to look after Jamie so on studio day my job is um, you know how some uh, thoroughbred horse races like to have a little fat pony in the field with them I'm basically Jamie Redknapp's little fat pony, so uh, I make eye contact for him and just I just basically keep you know keep an eye on him, and and it's it's interesting. It's very different to writing. Have I got news for you or not? On, on have I got news for you? The only jokes we write are for the host, the things that the host reads from uh, the autocue on the camera. Are the only things we write. Everything else is genuinely spontaneous. With uh, with a league of their own, it's it's slightly different. That we will 
we will write jokes for James Corden to do, but we'll also on studio day we'll sit and chat. It's like I'll go in with with Romesh in the morning. We'll sit and chat about whether there are. We'll look at the questions and go, you know, are there, are there things that we could. Uh, I was going to say pretend to ad lib there, but you know what I mean. Are there areas we can explore? Uh, and sometimes what happens in the afternoon is you'll get together with with Romesh and Jamie and Freddie, and you'll just be chatting about things, and you you'll just say, "Oh, Jamie, you've got to say that on the show," or a story will come up, or an anecdote. Um, so on studio days, it's basically making them confident about what they're doing and making them feel happy and relaxed. It's probably the the show on which I spend most days laughing, basically, because it's just. It's just a group of mates that you know what it's like. There's nothing better than just having a, a, spending the afternoon with a group of mates that you've known for a long time and you're comfortable with, and they're they're all naturally funny. And also, as well, there's still that thing. As much as I love Jamie as a cricket fan, I'm 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 sitting there going, holy shit, I'm swapping jokes with Freddie Flintoff. You know what I mean? It's like it's it it's every now and again you have to sort of pinch yourself. It's like when I did doing uh, Have I Got News for You, and you suddenly find yourself uh, sorry, but when I did. Um, League of the Road, and you suddenly find yourself in the BBC bar getting pissed with Shane Warne or or Jonah Lobu, and you you just go, "This is." Could you imagine this happening five years ago? It's and it, it, it's brilliant, but um, I'm really pleased that League of the Road is coming back. It's a bit different this year because James Corden. Um, it's felt best that he stayed in America, so Romesh is hosting uh, six of them. Uh, Freddie's hosting one, and Jamie's hosting one, which is going to be. Uh, very interesting. I, I was writing that episode yesterday, the one that Jamie's hosting, so that should be fun. <laughs> so what's that like, uh, Kevin? Because I read somewhere there was a, a story of Jamie Redknapp and Ramadan. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Jamie. J- Jamie's a lovely. I, I I can't tell you how much I like Jamie Redknapp. He's one of the nicest kids you could meet, but he's, he's not curious about the world. Let me put it that way. Yeah, he, he he hasn't got a favourite Shakespeare play, uh, and he's. He he takes things. If you if you look at him directly in the eyes and tell him something, he will he will believe it. Uh, and one of the things we told him was that there was I can't remember the particular joke, but he's, he wanted to say something in the afternoon, and we 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 persuaded him that you you know it's disrespectful to banter during Ramadan. Uh, so it got to the stage when the show started. James Corden actually said to him at one stage, "You're really quiet." And Jamie and Jamie went, "Well, you know it's it's." You know, it's disrespectful to banter during Ramadan, and Corden just went, "Well, a, it's not, and b, it's not even fucking Ramadan, you idiot." So, it's like, but he's 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 a good-hearted boy, Jamie. He's, a, he's but whereas Freddie, Freddie's, Freddie runs rings around him sometimes because Freddie's very bright and very, very sharp, and he's got a little bit of edge to his humour sometimes. So, and and Ramesh is just naturally funny. So, so it it, it takes Jamie. Occasionally, it takes him a while for the penny to drop, comedy-wise. But then again, he's not a comedian, so so why should he be? But it's it's just brilliant. The, the thing with Jamie is persuading him that people want to hear his football stories because he he just goes, "Well, it's just my job." And I say, "No, no, people people want to know what it's like being on the pitch with these people, and that's what the audience want. They don't expect Jamie to be funny necessarily. He is, he can be. He doesn't always mean to be, but he is funny. But it's it, they want to hear what is what the stories are. They want to hear what it's like." Being in a dressing room when you've just won the Ashes from Freddie, so it's a, it's it's a it's a great show and it's amazing the people you meet and I'm I'm really really pleased it's coming back as I can't wait to get back into studio. Yeah, we went to the show I think it was 2015 16 and I was chatting to Freddie Flintoff and he was actually saying he wanted to get out of a league of their own or out of that kind of line of work and focus on cricket. I suppose it's a testament to the show in a way that he's he's still involved five years later. Yeah, he was. Uh, that's an interesting one because I was there when he was he was telling because you had quite a long chat with him, didn't you? Yeah. Um, you interviewed him for uh, for something with Freddie and cricket is he, he was he was so good at it it's like it, he, he sometimes took it for granted because he was just natural to him and he 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 always assumed that he, he wouldn't be able to get into coaching because he didn't know he said like Nasser Hussein is not a he said his words not a brilliant cricketer so he had to work for years on his technique so he knows technique so he can coach it whereas Freddie said for me it was just natural it just came as instinct so you can't coach that but he still talks. I think he does. He, he, I spoke to him on the phone a couple of weeks ago about something else, and he, he he's back in love with cricket again. He really, really is back in love with cricket. And I think he would want, he would want to do something. I think he, I, I would guess it's more likely to be in a pundit role than a coaching role. I would, I would say, um, and I think maybe he wants to let a few more years go by so that the kids are not overawed by being with 
Freddie Flintoff, if you know what I mean. He's just another cricket coach, but he's still he he still loves the game. For him, it was a laugh. So he he doesn't care whether it's a, you know he say with that brilliant leg break he bowled. He's, I didn't know it was a leg break. I just bowled it that way, you know. So he's a, he's a fascinating character, Freddie. But and uh, he will be back in cricket someday somehow. I think it's probably hard for someone Kevin like Freddie that's been away from the game now for a, for a while to get back into it. Obviously, kind of newfound fame on League of Their Own. He's very well known and. For someone that, when he was younger, I've read a, I've read a few of his books, and all he wanted to do was just play cricket. It was as simple as that, and now he's found this this sort of fame from nowhere. And it's probably hard then for him to get back into cricket and and show that he's he's a credible candidate for for a coaching job. I mean, if the the thing with Freddie is he's an intelligent lad. I mean, it's a lot of sports people don't spend a lot of time at school because they realise at a young age that they're very good at sport, and they spend a lot of time practicing. Uh, they leave school early or a football club takes them on and gives them only cursory education but I, the thing with Fred is and he, he's, he admits this himself that he keeps looking for things to do he takes on all these like adventure sports and stuff because he's he's looking to replace cricket in his life and for Freddie it's not just the cricket he's looking to replace it's the dressing room and it, it's like a lot of professional sports people will tell you that they can kind of do without playing the game but what they miss is that dressing room atmosphere which they've had for 20 25 years of their life when they've they've been with their again they've been with their mates where they've been they've been in teams where they look after each other and he's, he, you know we people like us don't can't fully understand how that is and he, it's it's that that I think Freddie missed more than the cricket initially he just wanted to replace that dressing room environment and I think Freddie will keep will keep going until he finds something that does replace it Kevin, you've been brilliant with your time. I know you have to jump on another podcast. We just want to finish with a couple of quick fire questions, if that's all right. Of course. Yeah, of course. Perfect. perfect. Firstly, it's true you had your wedding at Selhurst Park. Not the wedding. Uh, the wedding uh, we, yeah, we, we got married. My wife's my wife's father, uh, God rest his soul, was a Methodist minister. So we got married in a Methodist church, or as my Catholic mother called it very loudly as she came in. Uh, she said, "This is not a church; it's a fucking scout." The reception was at Sellers Park, and, and we did, we did, uh, we did end up on the pitch. I'm afraid to say, with, with an imaginary ball, playing football. So yes, my wedding reception was at Sellers Park. Will you keep Wilfred Zaha next season? Oh wow! I, I've got a feeling we will. I, I think until until yesterday, when he played really well for the first time in a long time. I mean, in recent games, he hasn't looked fit. He's just looked frustrated. Um, I, I, until yesterday, I thought it would have been better to, to get rid of him last summer, even if he went to Everton. You know, if we could get £70 million for him, fine. Uh, I, I think we will... I think mainly because nobody's going to pay the money that Steve Parrish would want, to, want for him. Wilf genuinely loves the club. He loves Palace. You, you, if, you, if you lean out of the, the top of the stand where we sit, you can see the, the flat where Wilf was brought up. He's from that area. He loves the club. I, I, I think it's it's such a shame that Ferguson left Man United so quickly after signing Wilf, because I think he would have turned Wilf into a world beat. And I, I think I think Wilf is is without a doubt one of the best Palace players I've ever seen. But he's never quite become the world beat, and we all thought he he would. I don't think any of the top six teams will come in for him. Uh, I really don't. And I, I I think we'll keep him. I'll, I'll go out and let him say yes. He'll be a Palace player this time next season. Brilliant. Um, in terms of your sporting heroes that you've interviewed, I know you've interviewed the likes of George Best and Bobby Charlton. Who lived up to your expectations? Uh, not Bobby Charlton, I have to say. He was rather rude. Uh, George Best was fantastic. Uh, I met Muhammad Ali very briefly. Uh, Desert Orchid. Uh, oh, wow, yeah. Growing up, uh, I, I think after... after four, I love horse racing. I, I did a lot of racing stuff for the BBC, BBC Radio. I did Cheltenham every year for 13 years. I love... I love jump racing uh, in particular, and I loved Desert Desert Orchid when I was younger. My dad always had this thing about grey horses; they, they didn't try, but as Desert Desi was just wonderful. And doing uh, Cheltenham a few years back, uh, I was live on air at the time. I was interviewing somebody on air, uh, and Claire Balding came and interrupted and said, oh, "I've got I've got somebody uh, I think you'd like to meet." And and Desi was was there doing this sort of parade thing and and meeting kids for a charity and, and I turned around and there was Desert Orchid and he was old, he was old, he had you know shaggy eyebrows and shaggy hair and it was, I mean, John Inverdale and the rest of them took the piss out of me mercilessly but 
of all the sports stars I've met, I have to say Desert Orchid is the one that I'm most proud of having met, and it just, it it just really got to me. It just I just had, I just had all these memories of boxing days when I was younger with my mates, just watching Desert Orchid at Kempton for the King George, and it just and, and now here it was. It was it was brilliant. I know it's, it makes me sound a bit sentimental and, and soft for a middle aged South London geezer, but you know that's I'm not ashamed to admit it. A couple of one liners here if you want. Um, Champions League football, i.e., top four with Palace or win the FA Cup. FA Cup. Okay. Istanbul or Cristanbul? Cristanbul, without a doubt. <laughs> and the last one for Sean there. And finally, Kevin, advice you tell your 13 year old self before a lifetime of support in Crystal Palace? Uh, I wouldn't tell my 13 year old self not to do it, but I would prepare my 13 year old self for the inevitable disappointment, basically. But it's, it's again, it's not. I, as, like I said before, I'm, I'm delighted we're in the Premier League, but it, it's more to do with the off pitch stuff it's more to do with I genuinely think Palace are the most special club in the Premier every football fan feels the same way and so they should but they've given me so much joy and I, I still go to football I mean it's like on a good day there's there's 30 of us on a boxing day there'll be 50 of us on a bad day there's 10 of us but I've known those 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 lads for a long long time I've seen their kids grow up I've seen their grandkids go to the first game so it's just just being a Palace fan is is special for me, and going into that that tiny little pub that we go into, decked in red and blue, it just always it always makes me feel very proud. I I, I couldn't imagine supporting any other club, and I, I've been I've been delighted to be in love with Palace for so long. Kevin, you've been amazing with your time. Thanks so much for coming on. Not at all. It was a pleasure. Well done. I look forward to hearing it. So, Sean, I suppose one of the things we touched on there was Wigan Athletic and the price of football. And they've actually released that episode since, if you want to check that out, Price of Football podcast. But yeah, w- Wigan, um, we probably potentially have another bury on our hands. I'd probably link it more to Portsmouth back in probably about 10 years ago where Portsmouth were just in that rut where they can't, they couldn't really get out. Everything seemed to be happening against them. Um, Wigan, if you if you actually look at it, Paul Cook, the manager there, who was who was manager with Sligo Rovers for a while, he's c- come out all week and and they beat QPR there the other night, and he's come out in defiance, and everyone involved in the club, the chairman, and 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 everyone working in the club has come out trying to trying to fight the battle for Wigan, but it's it's the owners that just have gambled the club. They've completely lost all control over the over the club's finances, and it's a real shame because you know for us that that grown grown up watching Wigan in the Premier League. I mean, I the likes of Jordi Gomez and Hugo Rodiega, Paul Sharna, you know, lads that you remember from your childhood. We remember Arsenal playing them last game of the season in Highbury and Jimmy Bullard, and, and it's just a shame to see another club like that, another Bolton. You know, Blackburn are very close to going to the wall under the Venkies. It's just such a shame for that part of England, the North West, where you know football is so important for them and you know they've lost Barry they nearly lost Bolton and looks like we we could lose Wigan yeah Jason Roberts would definitely be my favorite player that era now to be honest with you but yeah in terms of Wigan um you know they their fans get a lot of hard time they can't quite fill the DW stadium but you you look at that they're the same as any any club and that's, that's what Kevin alluded to there the passion of the fans they've set up that crowd fund me page um they're really trying to save the club and it's it's them that are ultimately paying the highest price for their owners gambling their future away for years Wigan were as uh, Kevin and Kieran talk in their podcast, they were one of the model clubs. Dave Whelan ran a very steady ship there. They obviously won the FA Cup, Ben Watson scoring the, the winning goal. But it's such such a shame to see it. Probably a stark warning to football clubs and football fans how quick a, a club can turn, how quick a club can go. And it's a real shame. And hopefully they can try and fix things and get a new owner in. But there, a lot of questions have to be asked about the EFL's fit and proper owner test. I mean, every, anyone can become a, a football owner these days, really. Kevin talked about how easy it is. And it's look it's it's a huge problem it's something that you know over in England it's probably because of the size of the clubs like Wigan is a huge club and EFL certainly need to look at themselves there yeah absolutely moving on to Chris Sport and Crystal Palace I, I thought it was a really good insight into a season ticket holder there and you know it's more that match they experience he's missing more than the actual games themselves um, and just that bit of sense of community with, with Crystal Palace and 
you know, for obviously a lot of our uh, Irish people would support the big clubs where it's great to hear from someone who's mid-table and is happy enough so long as they're staying in the Premier League and being competitive. For Crystal Palace, it's probably so important to just have that sustainability. Obviously, they're very close to going to the wall. And I remember watching Sky Sports News around that time and they were ex- like they were ex- as close as you could probably get. But it probably shows you how important clubs are to areas, especially even in a big city like London that, you know, he Kevin still has that connection to where he where he was brought up near Crystal Palace. So it's probably one of those grounds that I'd say if you ask most Premier League fans, they'd love to go to a real proper proper football ground, great atmosphere there in a in a real diverse part of London, uh, and it's it's a proper football club. I actually follow a Crystal Palace account, um, just because they put up good stuff on Twitter, and I've seen a few videos of Crystal Palace fans chanting at Jose how he's a special one. I think a long term goal, and I wish I'd seen this before talking to Kevin, is to get Jose. So watch that space now if it doesn't quite work out with Spurs. But moving on to a league of their own, uh, I, sp- I suppose we've got a small bit of an exclusive there with James Corden not coming back for the new series. Yeah, well, it'll probably make sense, you know, uh, with with probably makes sense with relation to, to travel and travelling on airplanes that James Corden can't come back over to the UK and film it. But, yeah, st- still an interest in how they're going to work. Ramesh, obviously, he's going to do six episodes. Freddie's going to do one. And Jamie, uh, as Kevin alluded to, will be very interesting to see how he gets on presenting the show. Yeah, I think we're all looking forward to that <laughs> episode after hearing a few of those stories. But, yeah, it's a good insight to hear, you know, this, the background of the shows like that. And it does come across as everyone getting on on screen. It's great to hear behind the scenes. Um, but you suppose when we saw going over there a few years back that you don't realise the amount of work that has to go. Yeah, exactly. And, obviously... It- a lot of man management there in terms of managing all the different personalities and characters, people from all different backgrounds. It was quite interesting what he said about Freddie when when we met him there. I got the opinion of him that he wasn't happy with, with how he was probably portrayed. He probably lo- he probably loves cricket more than people let on. He probably would love to get back into coaching and probably something when the kids get older. You know, he's he's a jack of all trades. Where really, when he was growing up, it was it was cricket that was number one. And look, you'd love to see him get back involved. He's a, he's an incredible personality, a great cricketing brain, great cricketing mind. And every time he's on commentary, he, he's really in- insightful. And it'd be great to see someone like him get back involved in the game and maybe even raise the profile of cricket again. Yeah, no, he has dipped his toe in fairness into punditry on cricket or true Sky Sports. And I know recently he had a talk sport um, segment during lockdown too. So I suppose for him, it's just a case of pushing himself in. But I suppose they're having a good crack in the league of their own as well. And he is, he does come across, as guess Kevin says, really sharp and really witty. So um, yeah, so that watch that space. Looking forward to a new series of League of Their Own. Thank Kevin for his time. <laughs> And that's it for this week. Appreciate you listening in. Uh, as we mentioned at the top of the show, we're now moving to twice a week uh, shows, Monday and Wednesday. Um, w- this Wednesday, we've Bryson DeChambeau with Malachi Clerken and Peter Laurie. We're excited to bring that to you. Next Wednesday, for example, we have an inter-county referee coming in for a big bumper GA referee show. We're excited to bring all that to you at Tackling Sport on social media if you want to get in touch with us. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe to the show so you don't miss an episode. And we'd also really appreciate a review on that as well. And all other platforms, please follow, like and subscribe. Um, Sean this week we're playing out with Benjamin's song Never Be um, a really good music video here that I've linked in the description um, filmed in the Maharees so shout out to the cousins there uh, one of the better music videos I've seen now to be honest with you yeah, it's probably one of the nicest parts in Ireland to do a music video the Maharees down in West Kerry hello to all our cousins uh, and Ryan in the green room I hope you have a few points of playing ready for us when we get down there but it's a great surfing location uh, and obviously Ben's big into a surfing and uh, it shows in his music video that's it. All that's left to do is get the goodbye right this week. And we've had 0 and 2 so far, but I'm gonna crack it here. It's goodbye from Sean. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. This is Benjamin's song, Never Be. Song of Paul. Oh, she can make me feel alright. But she won't come home with me tonight. I wish the things worked out.